Hello, and my name is Peter Rushmer, and I'm your host today of a Half Dozen Things podcast. A Half Dozen Things is a podcast for business owners and professionals just like you. Whether you're an underdog hungry for success or you're already smashing it but want to continue to level up, we're here each week for you to get insight and learning from the very best in the business. No fluff, no BS and no self-proclaimed gurus talking about how easy business or life is. Just real, frank and raw conversations. I'm joined today by Roger Grafe. Roger is a filmmaker, broadcaster, as well as having worked in senior roles for Transport for London and as an architect as well. He's had multiple uh, occupations and careers and he's an absolutely fascinating gentleman. He's won BAFTA awards for his filmmaking and I got to interview him recently on Zoom. He shared so many amazing stories. We discussed direct vision standard and uh, certainly around making sure utilities and transport are able to get into inner cities and, uh, and understanding pl- transport planning. So, yeah, listen in. I hope you enjoy it. It's a fantastic episode. So, the red light is rolling. I'm joined today by Roger. Roger, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a, it's an absolute pleasure to have you join me. We've had a couple of conversations on the phone and uh, really pleased to have you with us. Um, uh, Roger is absolutely fantastic. If you're able to just give the listeners a bit of an introduction to yourself, Roger, and, and sort of what you've been doing and all of the uh, uh, all of the uh, experiences you've been through. Uh, it'd be fantastic. Thank you. Well, that may actually use up your entire hour. I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> because I've actually had a number of different careers. I, I started out to be a campaigning lawyer, and I discovered that the law and justice have nothing to do with each other, which was rather a letdown. Um, and I started in the theater and I discovered that I could get the audience's attention by directing plays and try and kind of enter their heart as well as their head. And I tried to really um, create social justice, the atmosphere for social justice. So the law might ultimately change as a result of people's feelings change. So I directed plays for nine years in America. I went to um, school and, and university in America and I did my first <clears throat> six, seven, eight years as a director in in New York and the East Coast. I directed a couple of television plays and I was doing really very well, but I had come to England for the summer and I really enjoyed being in England and I'd grown up in New England and I thought, Christ, this is perfect. I'm going to come back. And after several attempts that didn't work, I got on a boat, came over and a week later was offered to play at the Royal Court. Amazing. To direct. And that was just amazing. And so that was it, really. I decided to stay. And um, two years later, I had my first flop as a director. And I didn't much like that uh, because I wanted to do this social justice. So it wasn't just a question of um, my ego. It was more that I was wasting a couple of years having been promised a movie and Broadway play, blah, blah, blah. So I decided to make documentaries. And the first one I made was about um, a boy with no arms called Brett Nielsen because thalidomide was the big subject at that point and I thought I could do something useful for the thalidomide society and the parents and that film turned out to change medical school curriculums it won prizes it was shown all over the world on American network television BBC Australia and I thought this is it this is round peg round hole go behind the headlines tell the story of the people involved from a human point of view. Don't judge them, watch them. So I did a lot of that. But I'd grown up in New York at a time when modern architecture was destroying living communities. And I felt really distressed by that. And in the 60s in London, I found the same thing happening. So I committed myself from about 66 or 7 on to make films about architecture and planning and do whatever I could to rescue British cities. In fact, in 1976, I made a, uh, it was an arena, no, it wasn't arena. Um, anyway, there was, imagine, it was the 90 minute 
special on BBC One about Cardiff, about the redevelopment of Cardiff, because a yeah. hundred cities in Britain had signed up to get a city centre built by a company called Ravenseft, which is part of Land Securities. A hundred cities. And they thought, great, we'll give away our city centre to these developers and get um, all this extra stuff, you know, traffic movement, all the things we wanted, and they will, you know, sh we will share after the construction costs, we will share the profits. Well, we did the numbers in our film, Choosing Cardiff, because it hadn't yet gone down the tubes. And we proved on camera that the inflation rate in, in, in uh, construction was so high, they'd never, ever see a penny of it, right? Because rates from the shops and the rent from the shops could never be enough to pay off that because it was the construction fees plus 10%. Right. And, in, and inflation, you're too young, I'm afraid, but inflation in the 70s was in, in construction was 30, 30 percent. Uh -huh. So 40 percent had to be earned back by the developers before they ever paid the council a penny. Right. Uh -huh. And they had a 125 year peppercorn lease on the city center. Right. I mean, that's money for jam. Yes, please. Thank you. And sorry, we've got the diagram too. I've sent it to you. Right. Okay, sorry. That was my <laughs> no, wife. That's fine. Very, very wonderful writer. You should talk to her sometime too. She writes oh, about I'd Russia. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, maybe. She writes about Russia brilliantly. Oh, awesome. Anyway, the point is that I was intervening in the way cities were being made. And I started the architectural forum at the ICA, the in the Institute of Contemporary Art in London, and I brought the people from the Barbican and the South Bank in to say, what are you doing? This is about the arts. This is humanities. This is life. You are creating these dead structures that are just killing the life around you, just like napalm, you know? And this was the time of for something with the elegant name of new brutalism right, which is exposing the concrete. And as you walk by, if you've got a nice shirt on, you know, you can actually tear it on that stuff. Yeah. And you just think, what are these architects thinking of? What world do they live in? And guess what? They live in Georgian houses and <laughs> Victorian houses. <laughs> they don't live in the buildings they make. No. So I was stuck right in the middle of the decisions being made about planning. I, I was put on a government planning committee as the representative of the people. And I just became a thorn in the side <laughs> of, of architecture and planning because I asked all the human questions. Where's the, I taught a course at the, at the AA, the Architectural Association, which I called Where's the Door? Because I thought that really architects were doing what I call the balsa wood theory of architecture. They would take a piece of balsa wood, cut it very clean with clean sides and show it to the developers and say, right, you see this wonderful, you know, edifice tribute to you and so on. And there was never a door. You could never in those new modern buildings, you could really hardly find the door. <laughs> and I, so that was the name of my course. Where's the door? And I kept, Amazing. well, it was, I, I was, as it were, honored, if you like, by both being put on that government planning committee as the spokesman for users of architecture but also the architectural press used to write about me as the american architect roger grave because they couldn't imagine anybody outside the club was that interested and i was and i have and i have been all all my career despite making films about lots of other things i became a criminologist i you know i i was a professor of communications at oxford for a couple of years i mean i you know i've done lots of different things but the my passion for cities and planning and the feeling that everybody has to live in a house or somewhere anyway i did something quite that'll interest you i hope okay okay pete and this is i was asked i was put on um the riba the royal institute of british architecture commission for new housing okay and i did the design chapter and we discovered by using Ipsos Mori to ask hundreds, thousands of people, what do they want from, an, from, a, from their house? And they wanted three things above all, right? Space, light, and storage. And as we looked around the new buildings that were going up all over the country, we drove, you know, we did a fair amount of miles, whether you'd find a place with space, but no storage, with light, 
but no space for storage. You'd find one or two, but very rarely three. Right. And you just think, again, why weren't they asking the client? Because the, the, for them, the client is the developer. And for the developer, the client is the bank, not the people buying the flats, the bank. Yeah. And the bank will only lend money if you, um, on the number of bedrooms. So if you take the closets and walk in cupboards, right, which some of them had, and you put a cot down on a fold up bed, whatever, it's a bedroom. It's no longer storage. Exactly. Right. And if you look at some of the nice new developments, nicely designed, and their street line is ruined because there's no place for bins. Of course. I mean, just think about that, right? What kind of a house has no bins, no storage, oh, yeah, no, no I, recycling, none of that? Right? The architects just left it out. So here are these beautiful, clean lines with little black monsters sitting outside oh. spoiling the look right Rod, roger i'll tell you I, I live at a place called hampton in peterborough which is a fairly new development and uh one of my the banes of my life is neighbors and bins because i'm like put the bins away you scruff bags well quite <laughs> but, <laughs> but they don't have a place of many no no exactly and, and there isn't and there's no parking and, exactly. and all of these things and and Roger, I, I know you've got a, a, a wealth of uh, career background and, and play, playwright, filmmaker, all, all, all these amazing things. But what really resonated when we had our introduction conversation was around, you know, from my position as a transport consultant, where I help transport operators and fleets uh, sort of manage their fleets compliantly. One of the things that's sort of a really, really key uh, element of what I've been doing recently is London has recently introduced what's called the direct vision standard. And what's happened is, is there's, there's been catastrophic uh, accidents or inc not even accidents because they're, you know, they're, they're not accidents. They are incidents where, uh, or collisions where vehicles have collided with vulnerable road users, pedestrians, cyclists, um, because there's overcrowding in the city centre and the infrastructure hasn't been properly managed to be able to provide busways and um, yes. heavy goods vehicles to be able to make deliveries for the shops to be able to sustain uh, the human element of, of these towns. And certainly London is setting the pace with Sadiq Khan, but it's certainly something that's going to look to be introduced, certainly and rolled out across the other cities. And um, I, I think you've got some sort of quite strong opinions on, 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 on that. And it feels very much like people, wealthy developers have overdeveloped town centres and, and not really given any consideration for, for sort of the infrastructure. And, services. And, and particularly services, the services, services. yeah. No, I do. I feel very passionately. One of the things that's interesting about this story, for example, is that I, I, he happens to be a sort of friend of mine. Richard Rogers built the famous Lloyd's building in the city of London. Everybody loved the idea that he had the lifts on the outside and you could see the pipes on the outside. And that was his sort of signature, right? There was another company called Fitch and Company that were given a hundred and sixty million, something like that, contract to make the building work after it was built. Right. It was such a great look, but it didn't work. And the idea of architects um, just not considering how a building works has been the bane of, of all my involvement in this. And I remember being in the um, in the AA communications unit one day when the head of the school came in and said, which of you so and so's are going to teach these little bastards how to draw? <laughs> and I said, what, what are you talking about? You know, they're in architecture school. They've got in through. And he said, well, yeah, but they just don't think, you know, they can't think visually enough to take it beyond just a sketch. And the RIBA um, wanted to authenticate, you know, kind of co confirm every degree with plumbing tests, you know, tests about electricity and wiring, all those things that you have to know about. All these young architects, artists didn't care. Right, and you see the results so often. There's a famous story, which I'll tell you, Pete, about Frank Lloyd Wright, the famous American architect, who was rung up by his client one day in the middle of his dinner and said, Mr. Wright, Mr. Wright, we love our house, but it's leaking, the roof is leaking and it's leaking on my favorite chair. And architects tell the story. He said, move the chair and hung up, right? <laughs> And that's the architects thinking for you in too many examples. And it, I'll tell you one reason I think that happens. It's not glamorous. 
the services are not glamorous. Maintenance is not glamorous. You get no stories written about you for doing good maintenance. And yet that's what keeps, that's the soft underbelly of cities and any place, actual place. It has to have identity and it has to have maintenance and access for all the things you need, whether it's bins or, you know, lorries coming in and, you know, you have to have, it's a working space. It's not just, a, it's not a look you put on the wall or put up on a shelf. It's, it's a real living space. And people who neglect lorry, lorries having to um, deliver are, are just they're living, you know, in a fantasy. It's a yeah. complete, and it's not a good fantasy. It's right. one that just, that it's as though everything else happens by magic. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, when I was, I was on the board of London Transport for a while because I was um, passionate about trying to make that work, public transport, get cars away, you know, leave the space for those who need it. And that was a world all by itself. They didn't talk to the, the planners very much. The planners certainly didn't talk to transport. You won't believe this, but I learned this from the RIBA Commission. The Road Highways Commission do not conf, what they call con, kind of conf, adopt the road into a development until after it's built. After it's built. So all the lorries bringing cement and you know steel and all the things they're bringing are bring mud, you know, driving through mud. And no wonder nobody wants one of those on their doorstep, right? Because it turns yeah. it into the far side of the moon. You know. And you just think, why don't they get there with the public transport and private transport from the beginning? Yeah. Absolutely. But that's too logical. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think it's been it's been very frustrating for a lot of uh, a lot of the customers that I deal with that they've been it's almost felt like a, a stealth tax for them that they've they they've yes. potentially you know, they've got vehicles, whether they be buses or, or heavy goods vehicles, so they've had to stay abreast of the development with regards to emissions. So the yes. emission standards came in. <clears throat> we, we, we all have a right to breathe clean air, right? That, that's, sure. that's, 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 that's the right, absolutely, you know? And um, so they, they've invested in those technologies, but actually the vehicles haven't been manufactured. The, the utility of the vehicles and the design of them have been to carry out their primary purpose, not necessarily to be able to... Um, mitigate the risk of, of, of the, the society that's happening around the vehicle, so to speak. And uh, for, for London to have set the standard to have uh, said that you need to, you know, fit, fit these vision aids to be able to, to be able to see vulnerable. What's reasons. happening behind, behind you. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I, and I think, um, you know, it's felt like a kind of stealth tax just on top to be able to deliver into London. And a lot of these transport companies are going, do you know what? We're not going to go to London anymore. And, and we just, you know, we, we'll service the rest of the UK. And uh, it's oh, a bit that's of a worry very that disappointing. I mean, look, it, I tell you what, and in fact, I'm trying to do this on radio, um, which is to push crime prevention uh, mm -hmm. rather than uh, punishing people after the fact, right? And one of the obvious examples is how long it took to get um, mo in, uh, engine immobilizers as standard. It took years and years and years because it was they would cost 700 quid more and nobody wanted to, to, you know, to lose out to their competitors. They didn't care if the car was stolen. In fact, they made money if it was. So a new one. Yeah, well, a new one or if it's wrecked to repairs. Mm -hmm. That's why they put, in the old days, they put uh, taillights into the, the fender, the rear, rear bumper, so that if anybody touched you, You'd, those would break and you'd have to replace the whole thing. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. No, but I'm I just used to work in body repair once upon a time. Well, then you know what I'm talking about, right? They would build in the extra cost for, for you, not for them. Yeah. And it took, I mean, I was part of the campaign against Ford and the others, and we finally got it done. And then the next one was catalytic converters, right? In, in the hybrid cars, they're worth 1,500 to 2,000 pounds each. And you easily stole, stole you steal one from underneath until enough of us just said, this is, you are abetting the criminals. You're aiding and abetting the criminals. And they finally, now they bolted it on so you can't steal it. But, you know, that's, again, that took years. And why should it? You know, and why should these um, vision aids not be standard? They should be on every lorry anywhere in the world. 
Right? Are you telling me just if they don't go to London, they're not going to hit pedestrians or cyclists? Come on. Yeah, no, absolutely. They don't absolutely. care. It's an indifference that's absolutely, I think, is shocking. I really do. Yeah, I think that um, it's, um, it, it's, 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 it's a difficult situation that um, I think that we need to sort of consider the infrastructure. We need, uh, we need to see what solutions we've got. Of course, it's positive to make vehicles safer. That's a really, really good move. That's a really, really positive thing. And I'm, I'm fully behind that. I think that um, the vehicle manufacturers <clears throat> need to play their part, much like you say. I think they need to be manufacturing vehicles that are, Absolutely. Um, that are a lot that are a lot if safer. you want to write a letter about that i will very happily sign it i mean it too <laughs> no okay. i'm a fellow of the riba and and the you know former government uh, planning official if you like not official but represent and i just think it's absolutely it should be standard mm -hmm. i'll try and write an article about it i mean the I'd, we just keep pushing a boulder up a hill with this stuff yeah, absolutely. It's as though, do they not have do they never are they never pedestrians themselves are they never cyclists Exactly, exactly. We uh, we have a training actually where so we offer training to, to some of the drivers of these bigger vehicles, and uh, we we have a training called Safe Urban Driving, and they get to yes. go out on bicycles so that they get to experience they get to experience <laughs> exactly. the feeling Good. and uh, they they get to really understand. And I think uh, but that's actually such that's such a great example that you know actually we need to be a little bit more human about these things and actually exactly. have a shared shared experience and uh and, and be able to put ourselves in each other's shoes as to ultimately in town centers there's utility and you need to have utility there's no there's no other way around it and therefore we need to learn to be able to uh coexist with with, with what's been happening well the other interesting done. question and it's a really big question in your field that i've never been absolutely clear about it is midnight is nighttime deliveries yes right because a lot of the pressure on the the, the whole delivery schedule would be eased because there's so much less traffic but then it means all the people who are receiving the stuff have to work at night right and the companies don't really like the idea of night shifts and the insecurity of the building and all the things that go with nighttime deliveries but frankly I think ultimately with traffic, you know, it's yes, the zones, exclusion zones have helped a bit, but they haven't really reduced traffic. You know, you still get stuck in traffic and for, both for pollution reasons and for efficiency. I would, I think they probably should happen. Don't you? Yeah, I think, I, th I think, I think you got, re you're really spot on there. I think the the incentive then is to not only make the vehicle safer, it's to make them quieter. Because yeah. I, I guess sort of people's key key objection yes. to, to to late to late vehicle working would be noise. But yes. I think if there's, there's no reason that we can't reduce, particularly with electric vehicles, they're very quiet. Exactly, um, they're know, almost they're, too quiet. They're dangerously quiet. <laughs> exactly, almost dangerously quiet. Stop looking, listen is no longer able to listen, um, which is what I was taught as a child. Yeah, uh, I tell my children stop looking, listen as I'm teaching them to cross the road, and they go, "But what happens if it's an electric car, Daddy?" And I'm like, "I don't know." I hope they start to make them noisier. Yeah, they're, no, there's there's a button on the car with electric car that you can press that creates a sort of noise when you stop at under 19 miles an hour. But I mean, if you're going faster, and a lot of people do in urban areas, yeah, no noise. It's, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? So um, yeah, I think um, that it's certainly uh, night nighttime working is a is a really good solution. I think people. This is are Susan. This is Pete. Pete this is Susan. My wife. Hello, Susan. Nice Hello. to meet you. Hello um hello Susan uh yeah so um okay so what do you think from a planning point of view do you think there's is it sort of too late now or do you think there's things in in your opinion that we that the other cities can do to kind of reduce or improve road safety and utility without having to um sort of make uh, make too many changes or is it sort of too late with the way that the the mm -hmm. towns have been designed well if you think about the way um London, at least, is being torn up. I haven't really tracked this in other cities, but for cycle lanes, right? Then I th basically, I don't think anyone's going to do this voluntarily. I think they're going to have to be told to do it by planners. And everybody hates planners anyway. So, you know, this is going to be another. But I'll tell you an interesting story about planners, which you won't necessarily know. Okay. The 1948 Town and, Planting, for Town and Country Planning Act said every city and every district in the country should have 
a structure plan, a five-year structure plan, which was renewed and revised. In 47, when it was passed, at 48, it's 47 actually now, and it doesn't matter, but the point was that only Hull and London had planners. Everybody else didn't. So they turned over the structure plan task to guess who? Road engineers, right? And one of the reasons why so many cities have roads going through them or why Birmingham was built the way it was, the ring road, was because the road engineers didn't really give much of a damn about the quality of life in the city centers. They wanted mobility. So what you then had were these motorways being driven right through the heart of cities or around them. And the impact on the the coming and going in those spaces was really damaged, even though it seemed like you could get through the city very quickly. But it isn't the point about getting through the city. It's where to stop when you do. And that became a whole debate, which I was quite an active part of. I helped to save Covent Garden um, at the time when it was going to be flattened and turned into a kind of leisure center and stuff. And they did move to Vauxhall anyway, but it was about deliveries. And the quality in Covent Garden of the mix between the sort of 6 a.m. life in the market and the rest of the life around it was just not a factor. They didn't care at all. Right. And I mean, Covent Garden has survived thanks to our efforts, but I mean, collectively, a lot of people, but the market's gone. And that mix makes it much more sort of posh and poncy than it used to be. You know, any of us who had all nighters would go to the calves at six, four, five, six in the morning. Amazing. Great memory. Yeah, right? amazing. And you're sitting there next to a bloke, you know, who's just been humping huge bags of vegetables and so on. And it's a much more democratic, if you like, experience than having to go to the opera and dress up and behave, you know, it just, <laughs> it, it, yeah. it, it, so we saved Covent Garden, but we didn't save what was Covent Garden, the real experience, right? Yeah. And it's that, what I keep fighting for is the real experience. And then what you're talking about would require people who don't really think this way to do so, to actually think about the human side of their experience, not the efficiency. And I went, when I was on the board of London Transport, there was a guy called Bill Maxwell, who was head of the tube. I've never forgotten this. It was the late 70s. And he said, you know, the tube would work much more efficiently if it weren't for all these damn passengers. Amazing. <laughs> he wasn't kidding. I mean, he was a bit wry, but I don't think he was kidding. He, you know, people jumping in front of trains, being late, being packed. Closely holding the doors open, doing all those nasty things that human beings do. Absolutely, yeah. You told me an interesting story when we were on the phone around uh, the planning of the underground and the uh, the uh, difference that you made in the signage and things like that. You well, that's right. That I will, with great pleasure. I mean, I, out of the board of 12, 14 people, everybody else had a chauffeur-driven car, right? And I didn't. I used the tube. That's why they, the London... County Council put me on, the GLA, whatever it was called in those days, put me on the board. That was the test. I said, look, I make films about cities. I've been really interested in planning. And I'd love to, I, you know, save London Transport. And they said, how do you get around? I said, I take the bus and the tube. And they, I was given a free pass. Uh, you, you are on the board. And then they kindly gave me another couple of years. And I would go to garages at midnight. And they'd say, what's that? And I'd say, that's the pass for board members. Never seen it. No board member had ever been there to a garage or you know any of the depots. So anyway, because I'd used it a lot, um, I heard this guy, Bill Maxwell, say, um, I'm afraid we've had technical problems. The frequency of the central line is gone down from two and a half minutes to three minutes. I said, three minutes? The train, you get a train every three minutes. That's amazing. He said, yes, well, that's what it should be. And it's a bit slower. You know. I said, you've, Bill, you've got to find a way to tell people that because the perceived waiting time is much longer than the real one. And that you couldn't do anything better to improve the service, nothing. And they said, well, we've got a train indicator project that's in the works and it's in development for the next 10 years. And he, the next board meeting, we were shown it. It's the train indicator that's there now. And I just, I, 
using my ex-American role on boards to say what nobody else will say. I just said, you 10 years, do it tomorrow. You know, there is nothing you can do to create a, you know, a better relationship with the trains and the waiting time than just tell people how long it's going to be. Even yeah, if it's yeah. 15 minutes, you can just relax and read a book. Exactly. Yeah, and, exactly. But I think I brought it forward by five years. They said, we have to pilot it on the Northern line. I said, don't pilot it. There's not, make it work, you know. <laughs> and now they do it for buses. So, I mean, it really has changed people's lives. But they, this is this business about perception, right? Yes. They, they design a system in the abstract and they can't see the human side, right? They just can't do it. They, they want clean lines. They want numbers that work. They want everything that should work. The fact that it can't, you know, what's known, as you probably know in your world too, is called entropy, you know, in the system. It just, things get buggered up, things break, things wear out, things, you know. 100%. I think, think it's a, just the law of averages, isn't it? It's just going to happen. It's just going to happen. Life. It's, gonna it's go life. There's no it? perfect. This isn't a fantasy. Yeah. That's the point. In their fantasy, everything works. You know, you've seen enough architectural drawings that are always in sunlight, right? There's a Campari umbrella and a mixed race family sitting under it and these huge buildings behind them and everybody's smiling. Show me that, please. <laughs> and, and people and making sure that, uh, you know, utilities and delivering is, is, is what it is. Is there, um, is there uh, anything else that you're able to, to sort of add to that, Roger, really, around, um, you know, your, your, your sort of experience when you're working in Transport for London and, and that kind of thing? Is there any... Well, yes, actually, it was interesting. This is another story which you, you may disbelieve. But in my second board meeting, they distributed something called the Red Series, which said, is that your phone? I've just silenced it. And, okay, so this wasn't mine. <laughs> Apologies, just, it was just a vibration, yeah, sorry. <laughs> now, what I was going to say was that they, in their Red Series, it was a breakdown of the service for that month, right, the past month. And it said things like, the district line is 95%, Piccadilly 89, uh, punctuality, and so on. And I just said, simple question. I was always asking these stupid questions. Why? What's the difference between the district line and the Piccadilly line that one is more punctual than the other? And you'll never guess what it was. Right? London's the biggest employer, the transport in that, those days was the biggest em employer, I think even in Europe, certainly in, in England. Hi, it's Pete from Flagship Partners. We're really proud to sponsor a Half Dozen Things podcast. At Flagship Partners, we take road safety really seriously and we're your road safety partnership. We help transport companies with compliance and training across their businesses, including first aid, driver CPC and other transport management services. So if your four's accredited or you want to improve your operator compliance risk score, give Flagship Partners a call today. Absenteeism. Right? Absenteeism. Why? What are the causes of absenteeism? We don't know. We don't have a breakdown. You have, this is the biggest cause of your delays and you don't have a breakdown. We're workforce of 20, 30,000? No. Well, could I have one by next board meeting? We'll try. It took me nine months of pushing some of the bus garages did it on, in pencil on the back of an envelope, literally. And it turned out, among other things that were the cause of absenteeism, the workers couldn't get to the depot, the terminals, in time to start the trains on time, right? Now, you know, you do not have to be Albert Einstein to realize if you've got a system that doesn't just work by itself, but needs people, they have to get to work, right? Yeah, absolutely. But they hadn't thought about it. They hadn't really <laughs> planned, right? <laughs> right? And it took an idiot like me, an innocent, if you like, innocent idiot, ask the question. And it had been going for God knows 40, 50 years and nobody had said, what's wrong? Why are we having absenteeism and why one, two? And that's, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sort of blowing my own trumpet here, but it's what I'm really talking about is things like a space for lorries to deliver you know, goods that isn't going to hold up traffic and that is actually going to work for both the company and the people around it and, and the driver. 
Absolutely. Make it, and it's it, asking the right questions, Roger. Yeah, exactly. It? It's That's asking it. the right questions rather yeah. than just going, you know, this this is how we do things around here. Exactly. You've got to ask the right questions and uh, and not not assume that it's always uh, it's always the right answer. Yeah. At, you know, it's very interesting actually. One of the things we do do is um, we we help with sort of safety related and and, and human related challenges in, in in all types of businesses, and uh, it's very. I should interesting. come and work with you. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm, I'm happy amazing. to do it. That'd be amazing. I mean, it. I I've done consultancy. I did the London London bus map for them after I left. Wow, I went with the oh, circles with somebody fantastic. else. Yeah. And uh, actually, absenteeism records is always a very interesting indicator of a business. It's a very, very interesting indicator. The the what, what for what reasons can't people attend work? Um, and uh, I think that that's a very you know, I think for anyone listening, if they if they've obviously got a business or they're an employer, I think it's certainly something worth interrogating because it's always one of those questions that no one, maybe people don't ask because they don't think to ask, or maybe they just don't want to know the answer. I think both. <laughs> no, I think it is both because the answer might be, my wife uses the car to go to her work. Right, and if I if my cycle has a flat tire or there is the tubes aren't working or whatever it is, I can't come. It's not means they're lazy. They're not bunking off. They just can't get there. And this is, Pete, you, you will find this, I'm sure yourself. But what I found, being interested in transport, was not a widely shared passion. It really wasn't, and I think that's tragic. Everyone likes cities, everyone likes architecture, but transport and planning, particularly transport, it's, it's the, un, you know, the unseen bloodstream. It's almost like not being interested in your own bloodstream. It is the bloodstream. It's the nervous system of cities. It's both. The, it's both. The flow of goods is the blood and the actual connections, the system itself, is the nervous system of every city. It's the skeleton, everything, all of that. And people should be paying far more attention. There's an interesting book, and which I commend to all the listeners, both listeners, um, called Community and There Privacy. should be a few more, hopefully. I hope so. <laughs> it's, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant book called Community and Privacy by um, Serge Chermayev, great architect, and Christopher Lash, who's a critic, architectural critic, very good. And they start the book by saying, look at Los Angeles, all these roads, it's a city of roads, basically. And the all of that, like 30% of the city is made up of roads. That, and they're used for an hour a day. Right? Go to work, get to school, and then stop. You know, park. You, so much of it needs for parking because everyone's using cars. And you just think, okay. Where's the life? I once, when I had to do a series, a t a present a series in California, I went to Los Angeles and I had forgotten my driver's license. So I couldn't hire a car and go to the studio. So I rang up the studio and said, what's the bus? What n bus number goes from my hotel to your studio? They, they said, what? It's like I was asking a question in Chinese. What bus do I take to get to your studio? Bus? Nobody takes that bus. We'll send somebody. And they did. Every day they just sent, sent uh, one of the producers picked me up in a car and drove me there. It was inconceivable that I could get there on time. And of course, maids and manual workers and porters and so on, they had to. So such bus service as there was, wasn't good enough for ordinary people like me. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, fascinating. But that, that business about the, the roads, there are all these roads, 30% of the city used for an hour a day. Wow. Wow, it's incredible, isn't it? Absolutely well, incredible. So that's the kind of understanding, if you like, about how we use our space. Yeah. And now that people are going to work from home. Well, I'll tell you another story. I Detroit, I made a film about Detroit, you, some of the people might have seen, called um, Requiem for Detroit. It was the fourth biggest city in America and lost, went from 4 million to 800,000 after the riots and everybody moved to the suburbs, which they invented more or less, right? The first suburbs were in Detroit, the first shopping center were in Detroit because they wanted people to buy cars, right? That was the, the idea. So the center of the city just hollowed out and they, ran, they destroyed the trams. They actually ripped up the trams so people would have to buy cars, right? 
And it, I mean, it's really tragic stuff. But the point was that here we were in 2010, whether I can't remember exactly when we did it, on all these huge motorways which were built. There were like two or three cars. There was no more traffic. There was no more life even on the roads, right? Everybody had moved out because and the center of the city had literally just been destroyed like a bomb hit, hit it or something. The biggest post office in America had trees growing through it. The biggest railway station in America, the same thing, trees growing through the roof of these cities, of these trains, right? And what was interesting that a lot of workers who had come from the South to join the car companies when they were thriving, it was, you know, last in, first out, they were still stuck in the center of the cities. So they, because they'd come from the South and were farmers, they used to farm, they started farming in Detroit in the vacant lots and the, the places that had just been abandoned. So, so many houses, there was just, so the urban farming movement, which is now very big in America, started in Detroit because the car industry fled and did all the workers, middle classes fled and it was an empty city. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, absolutely fascinating. I, well, I think of, I've never been to Detroit, but I, I think of um, well, I don't know if you've come across Eminem, but I think of his film. Eight oh, Mile. sure, Eight Mile. Yeah. That's exactly. Yeah. Which is and a, Eight Mile know, was the point. Outside of Eight Mile, you're safe. You're, and he's a white working class guy. Yeah. Right. And all of that inside the Eight Mile zone was just wasteland. You ought to see it. Try and see it. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd be I'd be fascinated too. It to might be on that, YouTube. Yeah. I'll try and put it on Requiem yeah. for Detroit. Query. Yeah, have a look, Roger. I, one of one of my sort of final questions for you is obviously you've you've made you've made a lot of films, and I know you, um, you you've you've won won various awards. What's um, what sort of your favorite? Have you got a favorite that you've made, and and, and what is it, and and why? Well, I did a series in Great Ormond Street, um, and again, trying to go behind the headlines. I didn't choose to make films about great doctors, you know, saving lives. I made the series with others, of course. I didn't just, I arranged the access and oversaw the series, but I didn't make the films. About the fact that doctors don't have all the answers. It's again, the human side of that story, right? So with the urging of those doctors, and the nurses, they said, we don't, don't want to be seen as angels, you know, kind of who get everything right. We don't. And Great Ormond Street is the hospital of last resort. So people only go there if there's really difficult stuff to do. So we agreed that this that we would focus on cases where they didn't know what to do. And interestingly, the first three, there were several children died in the first three films. And that doesn't happen in hospital films normally, right? There's everybody gets rescued even at the last second, not in our films. And when the PR people who saw all three together in a viewing for them said, this is terrible. When we depend on donations and people are just gonna feel we can't do our job. One week after the transmission of the first program was the Sunday Times fun run, which raises money for causes. They were they raised a hundred grand, something like that. Wow. Mostly because people had seen the films and realized how difficult their work was. Wow. And the next thing was that the this actually it moves me, really moves me. The next thing was after we did nine more, they called us into the PR office and said, you know, and we said, What's wrong? Who's pissed off? The doctors, the nurses. No, no, they all like it. But we just wanted to tell you that they're grateful to you because the parents of coming in with new cases with their children who are very sick, don't expect miracles. And they can manage expectations far better since your series was on than they could before. That, that's what I, what I do. Oh, that was incredible. That's incredible, Roger. Well, how that's, fast, how fast no, fast that is my favorite. That's, that's my goal, is to help people understand other people and yeah. not judge them so harshly. That's amazing. And to I'll think about it. the human side of their experience. Yeah, that's um, that's absolutely uh, you know amazing. I um, so when 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 I was younger, I was um, I was quite poorly myself. I was um, I'm lucky lucky to be here, and um, 
I had a lung hemorrhage and the doctors, they didn't know what was wrong with me. They didn't know how to fix me. Um, and it, it um, you know, it, your stories just tightly resonated with, with me particularly that I spent, I spent three weeks on a on a ventilator in uh, in uh, Addenbrooke's in Cambridge. I, I grew up near Cambridge. Good hospital, uh, good a, hospital. amazing, ho- amazing hospital. A really, really good, and I'm forever grateful. Uh, uh, Mister Ma, he he wasn't a doctor anymore. He was a Mister. They do- doctors it's tend to kind of go back right. to being Mister. It's all again. hierarchies. Yeah, and uh, Mister Mister Mahadeva. Um, he uh, he was very honest with my parents. I was 17 at the time, I think, so I was a bit older, but. Um, yeah, obviously I knew nothing about it, but he said um, the kind of last roll of the dice was to give me what, what was happening was I was bleeding from my lungs and they didn't know how to stop it. So they'd have me on my front and it'd slow the bleeding and then over time I'd bleed more and they were transfusing more and more Oof. blood in and then sort of turning me back over. And um, he said he, he said to my parents, I, you know, I don't know, we've done all the tests we can do and, you know, I, 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 you know, I don't really know what else. The last roll of the dice is I'm going to try this drug called Factor 7. And Factor 7 is a, is a drug that they give for, to clot blood for, yes, crash, vic- yeah. for crash victims. Yeah. I know, yeah. I know, I know. Yeah, and um, they gave me Factor 7 <clears throat> and uh, I started getting better. I ended up getting pulmonary embolism. So I ended up with blood clots in my lungs after I'd recovered and they had to retreat me with warfarin to thin my blood. Yes, back of out. course, yes. But, um, <laughs> but he fixed me. Too. He fixed me, but it was a roll of the dice at the time. You know, it was yeah. a roll of the dice and it worked, right? But it may not have worked. And and that's, well, that's life is, too, my, right? My, my, that's dad life was, too. my dad was a what they call a diagnostician. You know, he was a, he was a GP, but they used to call him in to say, what do we do? We don't know what to do. And there were times when he was the only, he was the second opinion and he would disagree with the first doctor and, you know, don't take them off life support or do whatever. And that was a very heavy responsibility. And that's the point. Doctors are perfect. They're human. And that we, we need people to know all the answers. We need politicians to know all the answers. We need, you know, engineers to know all the answers. There is no such thing as a perfect system. And what Richard Feynman, who's a brilliant, brilliant physicist, and I commend to everybody watching this to go onto Twitter and look up Richard Feynman, F-I-N-E-M-A-N. Brilliant, brilliant physicist, but he was a great teacher. And he would say, practically every tweet we still get now, says, if you don't know something, you're learning. If you think you do, you're not. I love that. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, Roger, it's been it's been amazing to have you it's have you join pleasure. me for a half dozen things. I've I've really, really enjoyed listening to uh, all of your amazing stories and thank and, you. And it's it's fasc- and genuinely it's fascinating. Pleasure. Well I'm and, very um, intrigued and I'm the offer of helping if I can in any I, 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 I gen- problems that you I gen- genuinely, have. genuinely appreciate appreciate it. Um to those listening, um if you want to find out more about Roger, I'm going to put a link um, to various, there's, there's lots and lots of information online about Roger that you can go and find out. So there's going to be a link on the podcast for you to be able to go and find his work, find the films um, that he's done. And, um, and know, look, at the, and look a, at the report called Building Britain's Communities and Housing, when it's whatever the title is, but on the RIBA website, the Housing Commission report, I did the design chapter and pay attention to human needs. Excellent. I will. I will. Fascinating. And uh, I'll, I'll put that in the link for, for the podcast too. Roger, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you Thank so you, very much. Great Thank you very much. Thank you for asking. I really hope you loved today's episode. And if you did, please make sure you subscribe and listen out for future episodes too. Please do share it across your social media channels. We hope to reach more and help more people. If you want to find out more about me, my name's Pete Rushmer. You'll find me across any social media channel and my business, Flagship Partners, and we're your partners in success across your business. Thank you. See you again soon.